See, for me, I had a thirst for knowledge. I actually read a book or two outside of school and learned some things on my own, but a lot of people don't have that drive or even, or even care to do that. Teenage Podcast, coming back at you. Dave Benner's in the studio. It's, what, June 28th, 2015. It's a Sunday afternoon. Had a couple beers, a little bit of food. How you doing, Dave Benner? Doing, doing all right? well, yeah. Thanks, thanks for them. Yeah, it's thanks been for a while. coming back. Yeah, it has been. It's been too long. That's for sure. And uh, I don't know, you, you, you took a hiatus from doing some podcasting of your own, didn't you? Took a little hiatus, That's yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was, you know... Definitely, uh, your book, what Compact of the Republic? Yeah, thanks for sweet. the plug. <laughs> yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's the sweetest. Uh, the art on the front. What's that from? You like that? That's from the 1777 flag. Really, the first. <laughs> Is it, that's sweet. Dude. Really, the first flag that would have been it's so cool. you know, accepted as an American flag. Because before that, you probably know this. I'm looking in your studio here. You have various flags that would have represented various states or the yeah. American cause prior to that. If you want to talk about either one of the flags I got hanging here, which is what Navy Jack. And then the oldest one, which is the Gadsden, right? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. The Gadsden flag is interesting because the Gadsden flag is supposed to represent, you know, a snake, not because that the snake is vicious, but because it bites back hard when it feels that it's been interesting. Violated, I right? always thought it was, uh, I always thought it had to do with the rattle. Okay. But it was concocted by Christopher Gadsden, who was a famous um, Navy commander, and a lot of people don't really even know much about him. Oh, maybe it was this, which doesn't necessarily disagree with anything you said, but maybe it was the rattle. It had to do with, I think, this. the rattlesnake was like... Um, like in the hierarchy of snakes or even animals, it was different than almost any other animal because of its like ability to talk to you. Like when you got too close to it, it would actually like you know vo- use its First Amendment rights and it would voice its opinion. <laughs> but no, maybe that was some BS I read on a what a YouTube comment section. I don't know, but that's what I always thought, or not always. Maybe the last five years, I just remember reading a few things where it was like people are misunderstood because it's a rattler. And aren't those only? Native to North America, or no? I'm way out. I don't of my know. Mind. I'm honestly not that's, sure. That's probably a terrible fact. I don't know, but I thought it. I I just read a couple nostalgic pieces I know where they were talking about that. So, anyways. But just one thing to add. Because what a crazy animal to pick, right? It's yeah, a it's, rattler. It's unique. I mean, but anyways, just one thing real quick to add too. There was kind of a myth back in the 1750s and 18th century in general that there was some kind of myth, and I I don't know if I can remember it clearly, but if you cut a snake into various pieces, like if you split his body yeah. into various pieces, It'll grow they, back. it would grow back at midnight yep. or something like that sure. in, in moonlight. And Benjamin Franklin actually wrote a pictorial, uh, pi- a picture of a snake for in promotion of the cause of joining the states to oppose French in- interests in the French and Indian War. Like if you see, if you Google, you know, Benjamin Franklin yes. snake, you can see like, well, have you seen that cartoon? Yeah, before? you see that it's, a lot of times I believe it's in the shape of this Navy Jack flag I got hanging exactly right here. Exactly it is, yeah. But it shows it actually in sections. Exactly, right. Re- yep. section and representing that's a, a separate So state. you're saying that's a Benjamin Franklin version? Yeah, he, he wow, drew that little picture. Yeah. Wow, very yeah. cool. Dude, that's sweet. <laughs> interesting tidbit, I suppose. And then, um, God, what's the other? So that the cover of your book is that an actual picture of a flag, or is it like an artist depiction, or what is that? Yeah, it's my friend that made it, and he's a it's brilliant awesome. artist. Yeah, I think he did a great job. I love kind of the texturized image of it, but yeah, it's just to represent really what I'm trying to get at is the original conception of the American Union, which is you know what I consider to be drastically far from what we're experiencing today, and especially how the federal government operates. So, it's think, just, yeah, most people would agree. <laughs> it's just supposed to represent like the original compact of the Republic. You got to check out his book. Uh, not a shameless plug. I'm telling you, it's a great, great book. I haven't finished it, but just being honest, but I love it. And uh, the cover, I don't know. It's, it's like super clean, super stylish. I don't know. I'm just like. <laughs> artistic that's what all the kids are calling it, it. i'm oh sure yes. yeah yeah and it's uh what's the best way to get it 
Oh yeah, thanks for asking. Um, it's available on www.amazon.com. If you search, <laughs> if you search her compact, www. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I asked. Shoot that in there. But if you search her compact of the Republic, you'll find it. Otherwise, there's a link at my website www.dayofbenner.com. It's kind of funny actually because someone told me that they were searching for something Star Wars because like in the Star <laughs> Wars universe, like they have the Republic, yeah. right? Okay, the Galactic Republic. Well, like. I love this association. I'm just hoping that there's millions of Star Wars fans that just happen to search for something regarding <laughs> Emperor Palpatine or something and come across my book. So I'm I'll sure t- they're just waiting and salivating. Uh, I'll I'm take sure, it. dude. Man. But yeah. So and and you said you're uh, you've got what minor minor revisions otherwise it was nearly exactly the first edition was how you want it to be yeah i'm proud of how it ended up i am in the process of just going through a few things uh rewriting them um for a second edition that should be out by the end of summer maybe um fall but you know it's it's a complete book in its own right there's there's nothing that's going to be drastically changed so you're not going to be cool. missing out if you get it right now and so how are you balancing that time with because you're working on a, a completely new work right yeah um i'm contributing articles to the 10th amendment center and the abbeville institute but yes i'm also working on a new book it's going to be a long-term project maybe be out next year at some point but we'll see and it's going to be regarding new york specifically new york's ratification struggle and what that state went through in consideration of the constitution arguments on both sides and really ultimately how that state accepted the constitution can you give us like a teaser as far as what made new york uh, a unique example maybe or something you know oh, yeah. i'm very unfamiliar with all that yeah so. absolutely i'll try to do this as, as quickly as possible but <laughs> sure <laughs> new york's two representatives to the philadelphia convention well three representatives to the philadelphia convention did basically not agree uh robert yates and john lansing could not agree with sure. alexander hamilton on almost anything and when yates and lansing thought that the philadelphia convention had overstepped its authority they actually left in early july and they became completely antagonistic against the constitution they thought that this was a nationalist plot to completely nationalize government and they really just reviled the hamiltonian cause of really you know creating a a national nation state rather than you know a league of states so this kind of sparked a huge debate new york's governor a guy named george clinton not the member of parliament the the other george clinton opposed it also and it really (laughs) i mean everyone knows about the federalist right well the federalist was a series of essays to advocate the constitution but they don't really know about the writing which by the way more and more i'm hearing at least on the media that you and i probably listened to in the debates were amongst that the federalist is symbolic later like almost like a van gogh or something i just made up that analogy but right it they're saying that it had minimal impact at the time it's just a great documentation uh, i absolutely really agree yeah with and i've just come to just terms said, with yeah. that and i haven't read all of the federalist yeah. but i've have somewhere you know they call it the federalist papers right when you buy it as a right. as a publication and it's really interesting but yeah until recently and listening to a lot of these dudes um i'm like wow i guess i guess Proof is in the pudding, but it came way later. It came yeah. after its prime. What you what you just said is accurate. By the time that the Federalist had completed its print run, eight states had already ratified the Constitution. So it was really an afterthought that the Constitution was going to be ratified. Secondly, it was known that really the the Constitution had to be viewed based on the debates that took place in the independent states, not the the essays that were written, some of which were very good, good explanations, good sure. counter arguments. But the Federalists, there's not really much evidence that it was widely distributed either. So the sure. best book on this, if people are interested regarding this uh, interpretation of history, is Albert Furtwangler's <laughs> The Authority of Publius. Excellent book. <laughs> Excellent book. I'm laughing, and so is most of the people, whoever the hell they are, that listen to Team Age podcasts. So that's say that again one more time, not to be yeah. Okay. No, I, I really recommend this book. It's say a it short read. It's like probably eighty pages, maybe a hundred pages. It's called "The Authority of Publius" by Albert Furtwangler. <laughs> you love his name. That's the best. That's awesome. And <laughs> and. Uh, and is he, is he in your new book? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'll be referencing his. <laughs> I'll be referencing some of his uh, writing in there, yeah. Because I do ascribe to that. I, I do subscribe to that belief, and yeah. a lot of people don't know that. Or, 
I mean, they see the Supreme Court justices have cited the Federalists as kind of like the definitive account. Really? It really Supreme Court be. justices have cited the Federalist as precedent for their decision, yet turn on 2015 news and it doesn't appear to even be close to anything like that. <laughs> right. Even remotely close. Right. And I'm not saying that there's nothing good in the Federalist, but you have to understand it was written by... Two of, at the time, the most nationalist politicians that were really selling the Constitution to New York. It, it, it had great, great John Jay? points of emphasis. Uh, well, primarily Hamilton and Madison, yeah. but Jay did contribute five articles prior to becoming sick, and then he couldn't finish the rest okay. of it. Okay, because he's the dude, like, you just know his name from the Federalist, and then the rest of it, I don't know anything sure. about. Sure, and dude. Jay, I mean, all three of those guys were pretty devout nationalists at, at the time. Madison would eventually completely go to the other side and liken his self with uh, Jeffersonianism. But yeah, Hamilton and Jay were prominent uh, politicians as well. Well, since we're on this subject, um, one thing that I wanted to ask you about in some way, shape or form, and I didn't know how to transition into it, but I knew we'd end up on it is Magna Carta. And there's been a lot of stuff in the last couple months, which we don't even have to cite on specific examples of why the Magna Carta is a document, which at 1225, 1265, 1215. 1215. Oh, what the heck? One digit off every time, I guess. But um, at the time of those guys, the Federalist, everything, I mean, how often were, were their minds going back to 1215 and to the, the ideas during, you know, the whole Magna Carta deal? Because um, that was basically what, getting rid of the divine right of kings? Or no, was that even later? Was uh, that already going on? In a way, I mean, monarchs throughout Europe clung to that idea until, mm -hmm. you know, really. But it was already, what, thing. organically and naturally fading? Sort of like the Civil War, but slavery in, like, a dozen other countries is already, like, you could see it going away. It was, it was going to have an end. Uh, maybe not at all until the agreement okay. between John and the Barons. So that was the, the catalyst, in a way. There wasn't, like, anything that you can pull out of your hat. Before, before the that. Magna Carta, there was really no written, clear, direct denunciation that survived of the right or, i mean unrivaled that's what i mean like magna carta let's say it was celebrated yeah. even immediately in the next century or two and there was another document which we don't maybe it exists even somewhere but its relevance was just not pimped out per se and you know you just don't have anyone citing it you don't have the late 1700s in colonial america citing it that's all i just view yeah. like the more i get into history i'm like there's got to be these like more sine waves rather than like everything stagnant and one guy comes along or one person and they're just like borderline fucking magical and then they just change history forever and i'm like i wonder how much of that is after the fact even if it's immediately after the fact it's sort of like uh before i haven't even googled this guy forever but during like the protestant reformation was it switzerland and in zurich switzerland i mean it was basically the same thing that martin luther was doing and it was before and it was you know who zwingli was or no uh, I'm not too it's, well accommodated yeah. on this. But system. have you heard of that dude's name? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and so it's one of those things, like, I had to learn about him in college, and I better not go any deeper in this podcast because I never don't listen to my ignorance, but it was just one of those things where you're like, oh, there was other stuff going on 1,000 miles away or 500 miles away or whatever. And so I think it just, I don't know, it makes me as, quote, unquote, very big bunny ear quotes, an adult now, <laughs> uh, interpreting history is more like these sine waves, and that's why it's so interesting. It's like, yeah, the... The ink hit the paper on 1776 on this, or the ink hit the paper in 1215 Magna Carta. But I don't know. That's what's like. That's why when I talk to you, I love to ask these like kind of interesting questions, or even ramble on about those aspects of how it could be documented. Because I feel like if you buy into the whole deal, you got to realize there's got to be fluff on the front and the back end of that thing, and it's probably part of a wave. It's probably whoever was at the crest of the wave at the right time and made that shit happen. That's the way I see history, especially when you go back to the fucking Magna Carta 1215 and stuff like that, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. There's there's ebbs and flows as to when, you know, certain constitutional documents in British, uh, Britain's history have been kind of reinvigorated and reemphasized. Yeah. And Magna Carta is no different. Actually, believe it or not, Magna Carta almost lost all of its emphasis and, and um, kind of... Uh, how do I say it? emphasis and importance until actually the 17th century. Really? A lot of the Magna Carta was completely disregarded until like the Puritan revolution against uh, King Charles Stuart in the middle of the 17th century, where, you know, 
people said, you know, Charles Stewart, you're not abiding by the terms of the Magna Carta. So actually for a period of a few hundred years, the Magna Carta wasn't really considered um, of the utmost importance, believe it or not. Which would then build up the theory that it was a diamond in the rough, that it was a catalyst. It was a crazy example of just, boom, something going from zero to 60, you know? Yeah, it was an interesting product of its time, really. It was, it was you know, the first denunciation of ro- unrivaled royalist prerogative, where yep. the notion that the king could have power that was checked by no one but God, right? Yep. Um, but the barons thought otherwise, and really, there's a lot of aspects in the Magna Carta that I think are even relevant today. Some of the things that the barons were complaining about are the exact same arguments and complaints <laughs> and difficulties that we find when Why don't you name some of those government. arguments, and then we'll transition, uh, or not even transition, but harp on what rights are then okay because i'm sure that yeah. that's exactly that's why i brought it up right now before you said some of those arguments sure let's check all these a couple of these arguments and the whole positive versus negative rights debate directly relates to that as like a, a a key point in history doesn't it yeah well yeah okay i'll just cite three of the most important really quick the first was that king john instituted the western world's first income tax prior to that income had not been taxed it all directly by the king even in england the king used something like a skewage system when what that was is uh people would pay fees to the government to evade military conscription and things like that but he instituted a 1 13th tax on income which really is like an eight percent there's tax. thunder outside keep talking about that tax just for the listeners it's <laughs> awesome so sorry if it interrupts this podcast there's like so, boom thunder going so on. he instituted the first w- of tax. western world's income tax it's like eight percent and these rebel barons are willing to go to war for this yeah now we have a federal government that taxes some people up to 40 percent in some cases so <laughs> federal just the feds okay another thing is that uh king john intervened in the religious will of the people because when he nominated his preferred candidate for the archduke of canterbury which at that time was the head they made of the, the catholic eggs. church no they, they race horses <laughs> okay. yeah canterbury so lame keep going sorry uh they disagreed with his choice on that and the barons and the pope innocent three at the time wanted a guy named stephen langton well the barons viewed this as intervention into the religious will of the people, and that was a big reason. And then the last but not least is mm-hmm. one of the things the barons complained about was the king's will to detain dissidents Ooh. indefinitely Ooh. without due process of law, right? Yeah. And, I mean, this is relevant all the time. We just had NDAA 2012, yes. which the Congress defers power to the president to hold any American indefinitely without a trial. So, I mean, this stuff's really relevant still. Oh, it's insane. And it's insane. You don't even have to take a leap of uh, technology or a leap of societal structure and economic structure. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's like it's like a freaking transparent layer. You can just take off of one and put it on the other. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I just the direct through, correlation yeah. is sort of like the grievances and the Declaration of Independence, right? It's the same thing. Like when you actually read those, isn't the term "eat out our substance" in there? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. One of the reasons people George are like, "What is he talking about?" No, yeah. apparently you haven't read the Declaration of Independence because <laughs> yeah. one of the claims before they started shooting people in the face was he has sent out hither your, swarms <laughs> of civil officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. So it's, what has changed since seventeen? And then people that are like. Whatever the opposite of a literalist is for the Declaration of Independence or Constitution, which I'm not claiming one the other in the middle. I don't know, but but I'm just saying it's it's interesting when you read that and then someone tries to make the claim of, well, you don't really know what these people were saying, or like, or let's just be benevolent in the way we phrase this, like, just the fact that there's every angle of interpretation of what these people were talking about in these, especially in these key documents like the Declaration of Independence. When you just read it as a layperson for yourself. And you feel pretty explicitly talked to about what's going on, why people are doing something. So I guess my little comment here is, in modern times, I guess it's very interesting and it's cool to marvel at society and how people will spin something or or can spin something any angle and they can interpret documents in every variety of angle that you could ever think of. Even though when you and I or anyone reads these documents, you're going, these are fairly or very specifically written with a specific point of view, specific starting point, and then they're saying specifically what they're going to do or what they what the desires are. Furthermore, you know, 
oh if you, yeah if you agree with that like obviously you yeah. agree that it's speci- if i if i know you agree on something it's that a lot of those documents are written to be specified they want to like put down exactly what they're trying to say yeah i agree that multiple interpretations of constitutional documents are always reached but i mean it was yeah. thomas jefferson's position that the average person could read and understand the constitution <laughs> the problem yeah. is not that it wasn't simple the problem is that our language has changed slightly so it requires a little bit more context to know what you know for instance a bill sure. of attainder is but sure. really if people actually studied it they would be very easy to understand sure Absolutely. And what about the whole like Magna Carta, the period where it may or may not have been um, realized in the sense that people in the late 1700s were doing it. But what do you have to say, I guess, about positive versus negative rights in that whole call it a tradition or, or yeah wave of, you know, consciousness that's come up upon Western humanity or, you know, you can view it in a number of ways. But I guess, can you just elaborate on that? Because I could sit here and just keep drinking this Estrella from Barcelona, this delicious <laughs> light beer. And uh, I'll I could be listen to you elaborate for your, for your sake, whatever. Man. I'm just saying, man, I just, I got to ask you, I guess about positive versus negative rights in their context in, in these periods and you just get a blank slate. So whatever you want to yeah. say about it, but that's kind of something I'm always curious about sure. um, learning more about and just kind of, yeah. Well, for people that may not be aware, they might know a little bit, but not really have a yeah. great definition of these two things. Uh, natural rights is the belief that you inherit right, rights as part of your humanity. Yeah. Now, you may think that a gr- great benevolent God bestowed them upon you, but even if you don't believe God, believe in God, maybe you believe that you know you just have these rights innately because sure. you're human. So either way, uh, positive rights is the belief that government is the only legitimate entity that can grant you rights through you know a decree or a sanction. Right. So so it's real- positive rights and statism intertwine then i think yeah very much those two words at their root have to be right they do i think because statism is dependent on one's assumption that the government is necessary to provide you with cool permission to do a certain behavior right right? or a certain thing right which is kind of amazing i don't know i have nothing super clever or smart to say on that but (laughs) that shit just amazes me every time sure and some i'll just say like history uh, when it comes to history, some people consider, you know, John Locke the father of natural rights. And he wrote the two treatises of government, absolutely awesome articulation of what natural rights are. But really, he didn't invent natural rights. I mean, that, the theory of natural rights. The theory goes sure. all the way back to Aristotle and Thomas More and Thomas Aquinas. I mean, it has a long tradition. But, uh, you know, the, the people that espouse natural rights are generally considered to be classical liberals. Right. right? And that's, I always love to say classical liberal to identify with certain ideology. I mean, what do you have to say, I guess, about um, social contract theory with the whole way that that's skewed? You know, I mean, Locke and social contract theory and Thomas Jefferson being a huge fan of that, yet authoritarian neo leftists love just pulling the flag out of their back pocket of social contract theory. And you're like, well, no, that, that doesn't. You have a teeter-totter, you have this dichotomy, and how can both reach into their bag and pull out like the Lockean social contract theory card, and oh, and man. how does that exist? Do you know what I'm saying? Is yeah, that a I legitimate, do. legitimate like, question? This, I this mean, is such a tough question to answer, because yeah, no, I actually you can even empathize be comical. with you, you know, Go ahead. Just, I'm just curious yeah. of what you have to say about that. Sure. Just for the fact that you got a guy like Thomas Jefferson that loves John Locke and yeah. his you know, teachings and writings and just whatever. Um, but like I said, then you have a lot of people that would be completely anti-Jeffersonian, yeah. espousing Lockean social contract theory. So I emphasize with both viewpoints, non-social contract theory and pro for a few reasons. <laughs> Boom, so we're, we're in it. This is we tough. identify with all sides simultaneously. This is tough for me to answer because Come in down a to way. Come Studios, hang out with me and Dave Benner, we'll all get along. <laughs> Because in a way, I think social contracts that restrain governments in certain ways are a good thing. You can argue that, well, I wasn't exist- in existence in 1789, so sure. why should this be binding on my government? I didn't subscribe to it. I didn't ratify it. I didn't adopt it. But really, the, the reason that I kind of, in a way, support the existence of a constitution to limit government is because it's the ultimate enemy of arbitrary government. But it still requires that the tenets of that constitution be enforced. Now, social contract theory kind of holds that, well, you know, you're basically agreeing to 
this principle because you refuse to move out of the territory that it's imposed upon. So saying that, for instance, well, you're, you, you might not agree with the U.S. Constitution, but you're not moving to Kenya, so you must be giving it some implicit grant. Well, well that I think <laughs> is kind of bogus. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but so that's what I'll say. I mean, there's this. Lysander Spooner made the greatest argument, I think, against social contract theory in his book, No Treason. But, uh, yeah. What, what would he say? <laughs> well, he believed that the Constitution <laughs> wasn't binding on anyone lacking consent. So if you don't. Isn't that believe, what you believe or no? Um, or no. Yeah, actually, yeah. That's well, it. okay, this is what I'll say. I don't think the contract. The, the Constitution is binding on individuals. Really, the Constitution is a framework that limits the federal government. It doesn't... It's, Boom. It, it's yeah, all, yeah, an yeah. alternative to arbitrary, monarchal rule. It seemed like you, it was so tough for you to say that at first, and then I was like, what? Yeah, yeah I mean, I it like doesn't... Like you're, it doesn't inhibit individuals. It tombstone. inhibits government. So. <laughs> it's, the, it's the limit government, damn it! So, but I do empathize with some of Spooner's arguments. That guy was an interesting character in his own right. And I mean, how... Okay, so we're talking about negative rights, basically. And Okay, so just the natural, voluntary exchange of not only ideas, but goods, services, everything. They're, they can all or should be all pretty much lumped in the same bag of human conduct because they're all voluntary actions, right? Whereas we are raised in a statist paradigm per se, where basically, yeah, ideas, oh, they seem free, First Amendment seems free, but then you have this intellectual property idea that depends and is sort of invented by the state, at least backed by the state, enforced by the state, and is growing. And intellectual property is in the constitution, but it's so vague, it still is kind of in my view, now that I'm pretty much 100% against intellectual property in almost every form, um, you know, obviously you have fraud laws and ways that society can come together with language and depict what fraud is and then charge people with fraud crimes. So why do you have to own an idea for an arbitrary period of time backed by the government? You know what I mean? So sure. I, I don't know. Do you, first of all, before I say anything else, I mean, does that sound about right? Or do you uh, it sounds a hundred percent. You're right. Well, um, thanks, I've dude. come to the same conclusion. Actually, it took me a long time. It was one of the hardest yeah. things. And once I was there, I was like, how do I... How was I never here before? <laughs> Stephen Kinsella, if you know who he is, has written some oh, great material on, I've heard on a podcast libertarian theory regarding intellectual property and uh, patents. But yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, the Constitution did have the states delegating the power to the federal government to essentially create uh, laws that would you know, uh, protect certain individuals' uh, discoveries. That's, that's how it puts it in Article 1, Section 8. Oh, that's pretty sweet, dude. It's it's weird that they were on it, though, is, I guess, why I think it's sweet. In a non-positive or negative form, just to marvel at the fact that they were on it. That, just to that, think that about... Was happy. Well, because what was it? Even, like, um, before the violence of the revolution really started, um, mailing pamphlets and, I mean, just... So I lived in Ireland in 2006, okay? I lived on a freaking cattle farm. And you start learning about like the literacy of the Irish. And I always tell people, and it wasn't like the people there were like a lot smarter, a lot dumber than Americans at all. It was, you know, you're just people. But I always say that this, the dumbest Irish person I knew was wittier than the smartest American guys that I know, or guys or gals. But that's what I was saying. And they're like, how, how so? I, I, can't, I can't describe it. But what's crazy to me is that the, the persecution of the British Empire on them for so long uh, there's these weird things that are embedded in their culture and literacy and appreciating not only like serious literacy, like newspapers, they had underground newspapers that you go to prison for distributing, but for hundreds of years, they basically were like weekly or bi-weekly sending out newspapers, mm -hmm. to villages, you know, and you're like, just for like art and literature, but it was so, it was something that was so important. And, and I lived in this uh, cattle farm Went and followed my ancestors like an hour, hour and a half north of Dublin. And uh, via email, my grandma had their email and stuff. So I went and lived out there. And I lived in this uh, this cattle farm. And there was like <clears throat> a barn that used to do like, well, it was like a little village that was all like the farm now. So it was all these like, oh, you used to throw the lawnmower in here and farm tools in there. But that was all like, oh, the blacksmith was in there and the whatever with pasta maker. Not, not in Ireland. <laughs> what the hell am it's I It's getting me about? hungry. <laughs> Jeez. But um, the little farmhand house had these windows that were like bow and arrow windows or something. They were like two, three feet tall and like four inches wide. 
And I was like, what the hell? Like, it was so tiny. It was the size of this little area behind here. It was the size of Janner's closet. And that's where they just stored some, like, farm tools now. But the, uh, I was asking, like, my relatives. And I was like, what, what the hell is this deal? And they told me the guy lived in there. And I said, why does he have the big tall windows? Was it for defense or, you know, like, warmth or bow and arrows or something? And they're like, no, 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 no. It's because the British used to tax everyone on the amount of light like square centimeters of light in your dwelling it was like an arbitrary like state tax on luxury like a luxury tax and so it was another way to keep like the poorest people down it's like an oppressive very oppressive like completely arbitrary like fuck you measure from the state and it's just like the pinnacle like that's when it hit me like it was i don't know if this story is interesting at all, at all the, the, the mr dave venner here or whoever's listening to this podcast but to me it was one of those moments like it was like an epiphany almost where I've been learning all kinds of cool things about history and like the, the way the Republic of Ireland views the British Empire and still Britain to, to, you know, modern day times. But when they showed me that and I'm asking like, oh, is that for a bow and arrow? And they're like, no, it's actually a, like a tax. And you're like looking at these people getting no vitamin D, living in a shack, and they can't mail a letter without paying the queen. And so they have to like be felons and ship their damn literature in hay wagons. And I'm not comparing this to Harriet Tubman either, but you got a little bit. Like, you got to compare it to, like, whatever people grasp onto that defines their culture. And then you got to apply that to, like, whatever state w- was Im- imposing these uh, sure. ludicrous measures. Yeah. To get back to the whole, not only Magna Carta, but we're harping, as we always do on American Revolution, because I love to talk to you about that. But just the whole, you know, you're there. Basically, like I asked at the very beginning of this little diatribe we have, is a natural exchange of uh, goods services ideas just voluntary human interaction and all of a sudden an arbitrary group that is backed by the locke and social contract not to throw everything on john locke there's been you know social contracts egyptian i mean just everybody since the beginning of time so my little ramblings whether it's a question or just the just the way to get the conversation going i don't know just the whole you have these rights to do your thing whether you have light in your house or whatever Nobody should have the right to tell you if you're not harming anybody else. Wouldn't you agree? I totally agree. I would consider myself a voluntarist as well because I think that the only legitimate transaction that can occur between humans is ones that are totally voluntary from both parties. Because As do if, I think that, yes. If a government steps in and says, no, you can't trade, I think that is an impediment to human liberty. In the same token, if a government steps in and says, well, even if one party dissents from the transaction, you still have to make that transaction. I think that is also a transgression against human liberty. And I think when, when I was on your podcast talking about when I was in Iran, uh, you asked me some stuff about that. And we talked about sanctions, right? Or no? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I thought we did. I just want to make sure we did before. But, I mean, that was kind of the whole thing, too, where I'm in a country and they love Americans. I mean... And it sounds hilarious to some people that don't understand, like, Iran and just that area and the relationship for 30 years from, what, 50s to 1979 or 1980. But you go there and you're like a celebrity and they love you. But then you really look at, like, what do they call it? Carrots and sticks, right? Just the stupid cliche for sanctions and actual, you know, well, I guess, what would you call it? Sanctions and subsidies, maybe? I guess you could call a subsidy a carrot. Is that, is that the true sense of a carrot and a stick? I don't know. But either way, the whole Iran situation, when you're looking at sanctions and they go there, and people are like, oh, we're in the park with free medical like tents. It's like a little state fair or like food truck fair, but instead they're just getting like cancer checkups and herbal tonics and heart rate monitors. And it's just like this like medical fair like free fair in the the middle of the day and then people start talking to you about like the sanctions from european union and america and and all that stuff and uh i don't know it just makes you really think of what a sanction is and that act of violence upon someone else which if you get back to the whole idea that the free exchange of good services ideas everything is what we're keep going back to full circle here because that's what i want to harp on it's it's like anything relates to the ideas that they were talking about Magna Carta, 1776, any of those periods, when I was in Iran, they all were fresh in my mind, is I guess my whole little point of what my rant was right there, is all that stuff was fresh in my mind. All the stuff can be completely mirrored, completely used as a template to view 
other modern events and it's great examples of history repeating itself you know and i think that's where a lot of people maybe don't appreciate the whole oh history will repeat itself i mean if you just get into learning how people are people and then you go back in history and you kind of judge them on your own accord by the facts that you can find i don't know like the history repeating itself thing i can't imagine being 90 years old you know if you, if you started just read and read and read and you're 90 90 years old what the hell man i mean the world's got to look like a tarot card or something to you because a lot of these things they're talking about the same exact debates even the rebel barons in 1215 like i said i mean it's the same complaints we raise now so yeah i agree and then oh, and there's the whole- no new arguments under the sun there's only different situations for which to apply them that's what i think that's pretty true but what do you have to say i guess about like the supreme court okay you got supreme court justices as the mans in the dresses that oh i got a i got a big complaint i'm not getting anywhere but you know what the ultimate form of justice is i'm going to get the mans in the dresses and they're going to tell me what the hell's going on and i'm going to be righteously awarded reparations or retribution or justice or whatever you want to call it so in the ideas of transitioning these topics a little newer but still related to the time of the constitution and everything i mean we're still setting up a system of a hierarchy of basically and i don't want to say all white men which it pretty much is true but that's we can we could always divide that up to a separate topic i'm just saying you have this system of a a hierarchical on paper system with no faces and then you have the hierarchy of human beings being the top of those as far as their places in society they get placed in the hierarchy of the non-faces organization being government so you have like a double whammy of telling me justice is putting myself amidst two hierarchies one being a structured systematic version of what justice means on paper and the other being the people who fill those roles which usually come from another hierarchy does that make sense in a way i think i'm kind of following here yeah so i'm just saying like how is that how is that justice how is that the thing that came out of natural rights in that system when you know that the people who are in that aren't people that are living in cardboard boxes you know what i mean sure Does that make well, s- that's what i'm saying yeah i mean i think that that's that's a fair question i think that the ultimate thing that what that what that comes down to is that you know most people today believe that for instance like in the federal courts in our country most people believe that their chief job is to interpret the constitution or yeah determine the constitutionality of law right well, yep, that, that yep. wasn't how it was originally conceived of. It was originally conceived of a group as a group that would adjudicate disputes that would come from people, right? And it wasn't intended to have, you know, this monopolistic viewpoint on the Constitution that it could impose on every other person, right? So really, if there are disputes between two states, there should be some kind of tribunal to entertain the settlement of that dispute, right? right. But we, we've gone from such a system where that was the case to now a system where you know judges wield ultimate authority. A lot of people are so deferential to these federal judges, and they just expect that they're, all their opinions are infallible, and they're certainly not. But if it, So if their opinions or if their interpretations, let's say, aren't... Um, if, if it's supposed to be the way that it was set up, if their interpretations aren't the word of the land, like they are more so, let's say, today in 2015, they're in there as some kind of mathematical overtime, like in a hockey game or something. Is that what you're talking about? Like, are they in there to basically, like, who's interpreting the Constitution then if they're the ones not interpreting it, but they still have, like, a rubber stamp in their hand that they held? Sure. Does that make sense? It I, is a democratically yeah. uh, organized subset of some kind of process that it gets funneled only certain amount of them get funneled in this little extra avenue and they say okay now the supreme court's gonna rule on this or interpret this right well that's happened gradually i mean okay so when it comes to judicial review the principle that the the court weighs in on the constitutionality of law that that was conceived of hamilton argued famously in federalist 78 that the federal courts would weigh in on this stuff and would make a judgment as far as its constitutionality but in nowhere did the the decision where that comes from um it first enunciated itself marbury versus madison in 1803 did chief justice john marshall articulate that well the federal court would have the only you know monopolistic 
ability to impose its decision on all the branches and all the states. Because the Jefferson, well, the federal courts were part of the problem. Last time I checked, they're part of the federal government. So we're going to refer our disputes to this body? No, Jefferson said the states who built the federal government should be able to weigh in on constitutional. Is the moral of that just further localization is always the solution? I really have come to believe that. I think that that's the only thing I decentralization yeah, is that's the That's all ultimate. I can get to. It's it's like almost like a um not a religion, but like like there's I don't know if I want to use the term globalist or or internationalist or you know, there all those terms, I mean they're going to be used in a billion ways, but there's just a I feel like this dichotomy that's a real dichotomy where people reach conclusions from different they start in different places, but they either reach a conclusion that the answer is so local that it requires these aspects as a person of not necessarily hunting and fishing, but there's aspects of aspects of self sustainability, aspects of justice starting at the individual level and reaching outwards. And I feel like other people come to this conclusion that it's usually guised in the sense of things that I believe in, like we're all one, we're all one people, we're all human, team human, human race. We're all gonna save the earth together. And I, on the surface, all those cliches are like, what I'm about, I'm about that. But then on paper, on the little social mathematics spectrum, I don't believe that the state has a moral foot to leg, whatever, you know, pillar, peg leg to stand on at all, because I feel like the answer has to be local. Look at me, you know, Mr. Gardner or something. Maybe that's skewed my brain for a decade, and I hope it has. But it's like that's what it comes down to. And I'm not saying everyone has to be like feed themselves with food they picked or shot. But I'm just saying it, there's a perspective that goes along with that. And I think that the natural rights relates to that perspective. Is the local trumping national, local trumping global. I believe anything that you can do locally in a fashion that you understand all aspects of it. It's sort of like even think about pollution or think of anything like that. I mean, when you see where your litter is going or when you see where your sewage is going or anything, you're going to just take different measures upon that. And I think with the idea of natural rights, I think we can, I don't know, see it in that perspective. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, I mean, I think natural liberties are much easier to protect in a system of political decentralization. And, you, you know as well as I do, uh, Team Age, that, you know, sometimes the local governments are a problem, too. I mean, we see tyranny creep up and, you know. Well, it can happen anyway. Count, it can happen But anyway. I think it's how you address it, right? Yeah. You know, if you had a really local system, you wouldn't have someone firebombing Dresden. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you wouldn't have these heinous, like, take, situations yeah. in, in history. That's a fantastic analogy, but... <laughs> I mean, you might have the, the Mohicans and the, whoever stabbing each other in the face a few times, but you wouldn't have people like in the middle of a fire that are still alive suffocating from lack of oxygen before they're burned alive. Yeah, the amount in the of face power. of stopping tyranny, and you're like, yeah, let's let's teach them freedom. Like I don't know. I mean, well, yeah, in the amount of against, power yeah. power they wield, but also because I mean, I know that it's not always the case, but you have an infinite amount more influence on your local representatives yeah. than you do from per se, leaders in Washington, D.C. I actually believe that I, ha and I'm not going to give away the specifics, but I actually mm -hmm. believe that I have influenced a current member of the Minnesota House of Representatives to switch their vote on a particular issue that yeah. came up in this last session. There's no way I could say that about anyone in Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, it's, it's so weird, too, because uh, you look at... Um, like how people in D.C., how easily they're influenced. And without getting into um, too much political names, but I mean, even when Ron Paul had his Tuesday economics luncheon, or I don't know if you're familiar with this, yeah, but one day a week, Wednesday, whatever it was, every for years and years at the same restaurant, everyone was invited no matter who you were. And Michelle Bachman started to go. Yeah. And Michelle Bachman. <laughs> she started saw, reading Ludwig von Mises. I saw her speak for like a two or three times in a one or one and a half year period where she was saying like 90% of things that I wanted to be like, hell yeah. And then that whole, um, like when I went down to the, the coxing in Iowa and then like I was watching her speak from like three feet away and everything and you know, all that stuff was out the window because it was like, I, want, I need to be president time. <laughs> 
But my yeah. whole story. If you mentioned really about- Murray Rothbard, the anarchist <laughs> at that point. It's not. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, it's this really is not about Shel Bachman. It is. She's a key player in my little story here. It was just the fact that she started going to the Ron Paul economics lunch with anybody of any party in D.C. that is in Congress, Senate, whatever. And she started fucking like, lear- she started a learning. Started a learning for herself. And it was just really interesting to see someone with that much P word, you know, power, like straight capital P power. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot not to like about Bachman, but I really actually believe she started to adopt some of the. I know she did because you could see it in her. Of Austrian economics. You could see it like she switched, (laughs) and you're like, oh, sweet, you've been reading the books that some of us read. Like, hell (laughs) yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter who it is. Sure. Pick the worst dictator of all time, and they start like. (laughs) Hey, I'm starting to think this one. You're like, hell yeah. I keep thinking that. I mean, keep reading. Keep learning about economics, you know? I don't know. But, but no, it all, I guess all that, going back to the whole, just the free exchange of goods and services and ideas. I mean, I don't know. It's just such, it's such a phrase that I could wear it out like a bike tire. It's people, every, the average person doesn't support that as a wholehearted concept. And maybe I don't even. I claim I do. I claim I'm in love with the, the concept of voluntarism or other known as voluntarism or other known as capitalism or previously known a century or two ago as the creeping ideas of classical liberalism in the face of like abject tyrannies from, especially from Western Europe. I mean, does that sound right to you? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. All the concepts of, of natural rights being realized in these senses now and, you know, we can get out of here pretty soon, but... Uh, the whole internet thing, the whole trying to patent ideas, and, and now they're talking about all, you know, there's going to be so much regulation of the internet, we're going to see the first major black market internet. <laughs> and uh, that's a really dichotomous idea, too, because it's sort of like, I hope I see this tomorrow, where you're just, boom, on some in- encrypted, like everyone's free again, everyone's anonymous, everyone's just able to do whatever they want on the internet, free market. Um, but I also say I never want to see that because I never want to see it get to a point where the regulations, the government, the spying, everything hits a point that tips everyone to go to the black market, which is really the anytime anyone in the world, and I'll see if Dave agrees or disagrees with me, but anytime in the world you hear the words black market, what you're really hearing is market or what you're really hearing is free market. And so to even like flip it on its head, you could say anytime you hear black market, you hear market. Otherwise it's called, uh, you know, authoritarianville usa or you know you agree with that i do largely agree because when you hear the especially with the spread of ideas especially the yeah. spread of ideas i mean how tyrannical do you need to be to have a black market in the spread of ideas right go yeah Sorry. i mean usually the Sorry connotation is negative right like oh black yeah. market oh my gosh that's outside of the reign of the law well really what it is is it's a market where either the government chooses not to regulate at all which happens in some states where certain things are distributed without any government regulatory power or things that the government would like to regulate but fails at, both of which I think are good things. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, usually it has a negative connotation, but really black market is is really unfettered free trade. And trade is, uh, I mean, if you think of trade on a natural rights scale, would you agree or disagree, I guess? I mean, it's it's a fundamental aspect of being alive as a human being right? It's trade, unregulated trade. So basically unregulated free trade is an extension of who you are as a person. Yeah. Because to be alive, you're going to have to interact with other human beings. I mean, we are a social creature, whatever we are, we need each other. Yeah. I mean, all, all of the ability for us to thrive as individuals and enjoy life, I think comes from free exchanges. I mean, the reason that we have the clothes we like and the food we like and the, the leisure materials we like is because someone else was able to offer them to us yeah. for a value that we thought was more important to us than what we gave up to get it. So, But the pretentiousness as well, the opposite side, you know, when, when a collective says that, or excuse me, when individuals speak for a collective, yeah, I have uh, 90% of the backing of my local community here in Minnesota or wherever, you know, and therefore I have, you know, practically or almost literally sometimes God on my side and therefore whatever I do, even though it will force some people physically or, you know, through the threat of using physical force to change, I'm doing righteous work where 
the concept of a republic that's based off of natural rights is and or was and or both or neither, whatever. But it, at the time and to this day, people like myself see the remnants of that as holy smokes, that is a very superior form of, of operating in a society. If you're gonna have something called the state, you're gonna have it where at least the natural rights of everybody are quote unquote supposedly protected. And that totally beats any sort of uh, righteousness based off of a democracy or anything like that. And that's why I think the ideas of a democratic republic were so progressive at the time. Is that right? Well, uh, progressive in the sense of when they of were... new in history, because yeah. the the re the idea of the republic with natural rights. I'm sure you could go to ancient history and find some remnants of it, but it wasn't a dominant theme discussed and written in the sense that it was in you know, Magna Carta, 1776, any of those times. That's why I meant progressive, I guess, right? I mean, I don't know. Go ahead and tell me what you think, yeah. I guess, about that. Well, uh, so the word progressive, like the word federalism, you yeah, know. Yeah, I was just going to say, not context, even modern right? but progressive. Not, sure. No way. Like, yeah, not, at, at like the that. time, I think that Republican Correct. values were considered progressive compared to the alternative, which was arbitrary or royal rule, right? Yeah, I but, just meant like new. Let's just say like Neo or something. You know, I don't yeah. know. Like whatever you'd want to call it. Yeah, I mean, that's why some people refer to like the United States as a grand experiment because there are a lot of naysayers in the world that said, you know, you can't have a republic. I mean, it's going to collapse on itself. You know, certain power centers are going to usurp power from the others. And in a way, it's hard to disregard those, those viewpoints because it seems like we couldn't keep the republic very long. But... I think that's ultimately a problem in enforcing the the Constitution because if the, the Constitution isn't enforced, then the Republican tenets get whittled away from and get dismantled. What, uh, I guess, like the ideas of uh, mercantilism at the time that these um, ideas, I won't call them progressive, but maybe, they, you know, just whatever, uh, newer, growing ideas or re ideas that have been able physically to become in more human realization in the time of colonial America, being the ideas of natural rights, where people could have the opportunity, whether it's just land or, or physical assets or for the freedom elsewhere, but just the idea to realize natural rights in the age of the British Empire being the size it was, and the idea of mercantilism, and just whatever mercantilism means to you, um, I guess start off by saying that, but how does mercantilism and the people that were trying to build off of what was fought for and realized under the Magna Carta, how did those two kind of butt heads, how did they mesh? How did they form what we're still kind of amidst today? Because yeah. it was an ideology mixed with an actual physical thing as mercantilism was almost as fascism was a uh, hundred years ago or, or 90, 80 years ago. Or almost uh, like this global corporatism that we're under now, heavily involving the banks. You know, how, how was mercantilism like that? Yeah, well, I don't think mercantilism really applies to the Magna Carta because King John really imposed his will on individuals. He didn't really thwart their ability to get certain projects or, you know, ha do handouts or subsidies or monopolies to certain firms. But that did enunciate itself, as you mentioned, with the British Empire. The British Empire carved out their empire based on mercantilism. And to me, it really means an economic system that is predicated upon exclusive trade privileges, otherwise known as monopolies that are granted by government to certain firms so that they have, you know, the exclusive rights of trade in certain markets, mm -hmm. uh, subsidies, uh, economic favoritism and bailouts. And there were mercantilist, you know, American revolutionaries that actually subscribed to this and loved it. I mean, I'm sure you know this, but Alexander Hamilton is probably the most prominent <laughs> and he was unequivocal about his love for the British mercantilistic system. He made that apparent in his report on manufacturers to George Washington in 1791. But there are others. I mean, Gouverneur Morris, Robert Morris, some of the more nationalist politicians, but I think that it's, you know, 
it's unfortunately a treacherous system because it suppresses free trade and really picks economic favorites. Because how does it do re- that? Real quick, go back to. Oh no, you, okay, go. You go first. Okay, just real quick. In 1776, yeah. when Adam Smith released *The Wealth of the Nations*, yep. this was considered such a radical thing. Yeah, yeah. That you know, he believed the independent hand of the market could determine you know the competition and oh, interest it's like, rates it's and heresy. prices. Yeah. Well, in, in the eyes of most of, uh, quote unquote, the established. Sure. Right? Of course. I'm sure dudes with goats and shit in their yard were probably like, <laughs> I understand where you're coming from because I'm not an idiot. I trade, sure. to, I trade to stay alive. I, I may not even halfway read. Those even though literacy literate, rates are pretty sure. good, weren't they? Uh, literacy rates were pretty bad overall. I think even worse <laughs> in, in, in England than the United States. At no, the, that's or, what I, no, I'm so sorry. I just meant time. like the colony, weren't they a great example of like, so much influence coming there as far as money, intent, everything that w- wasn't like a peasant there able to read in colonial America more well, so than another. Uh, if you measured the standard of living elsewhere in the world, a hundred percent. Okay, yes. that's all I was getting. Hundred percent. Yes. I'm a, I'm not afraid to be totally proven wrong on that. I just thought it was one of those things where it was a great example of the spread of ideas. Sort of like my little Irish example. It was just a great example of where you had a snapshot in time where people were able to spread ideas. Yeah, pamphlets so and almanacs, like you said, those are the most distributed oh, it, items yeah. that anyone could would want to read. And you wonder like the desolation of the average person and like how they have to just grind to stay alive and produce enough food and well not even produce it, but just store it and have an economic balance with their community and trade and I mean all that stuff to me is just mind blowing and to be a fly on the wall and to be able to go back and experience something like that without having to go to the Ali G show and going some his- history camp or whatever where he's flaming on people <laughs> yeah you know but like to actually see how raw these fucking people were dude when I started making beer and cider and wine it was so crazy because I started learning about colonial America because they'd have <laughs> they'd pick apples and press them for cider <laughs> But it was dangerous to eat apples or to drink apple juice. Like, just press apple juice and drink it. Like, your odds of getting sick were just like 10 or 100 fold or something, unless you let that ferment and start to produce alcohol. And so they would open it up, just like I do when I make beer and whiff that shit. And then when their face melted, because there was booze in the air, and they're like, oh, a coffin. <laughs> go, yep, apple, apple juice is ready or whatever. But it's like all these guys I read dozens of times, doesn't mean it's right. But I remember reading that one of the first things they would do in the morning was drink a pint of hard cider. And I was just like, you ever, you ever, uh, was it Thaddeus Russell? You know, that is the historian. I but don't he's got, like renegade know. history of America, but he talks, uh, you know about drunkenness? I've heard of that book, but uh, alcoholism today was, a- was the entry level to what they used to call drunkenness. And it was like an actual business operating factor. Like if you had a factory, if you were in a military, like people were wasted off their fucking ass all day. Like even a hundred years ago, they were blasted all the time. And there was a medical condition they called drunkenness. And it was so insane because this was even like during the industrial revolution. And there's all these documents about how like even the work week, apparently the Monday through Friday work week relates to drunkenness. Like it relates to a couple like religious holidays and then people would drink so much that the, the day that they would be like almost sick, I think it was Sunday or something. But anyways, it was, I don't know. You should check out Thaddeus Russell, dude. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate the I think I'm even Facebook friends with the dude. Like he said, renegade history of the United I States. I think right? it's I've called something book, like that. But... Oh, dude. It's so cool. Okay. I don't know. But anyways, the whole colonial thing, like making hard cider and it was just cool just to get in the mindset. Like, yeah, every day. I don't know, Thomas Jefferson or someone <laughs> would wake up and have a pint of hard cider and do his thing. Well, that you mention it, there was one president that was particularly known for being a complete alcoholic throughout most of his life, including his presidency. And that's a guy I think was actually probably a top 10 president, Franklin Pierce. I wrote a little bit about him, but there's many things to possibly sure. explain it. But he actually witnessed on his way to Washington to become inaugurated as the president the death of his very young son. I think he was like uh, three oh or something. His son died in this freak railroad crash. And the corpse was viewable. His wife saw the corpse and it Jeez. devastated their lives for years. He would supposedly wander through the White House, uh, you know, drinking all the time. And it affected him Jeez. to the end of his life. But, I mean, you're right. It's, I think especially in the 19th century, alcoholism was really rampant in some segments. And even the president was known for that at the time. Well, you think it was the 19th century? You think it was also the 
18th, 17th, and 16th century, 20th century. I don't know. I haven't I, done a good analysis. I'd I mean, wasn't it no Churchill? More, wasn't he the one who drank like two quarts of brandy every day? And, like, <laughs> I, think I don't know, oh, I don't but know, I'd love dude. to know more about like an analysis of you know relatively how much people drank. I, I don't know the correct answers. So. Well, before the show, we were talking about Joseph's story, and because I, okay, so our buddy Jake Dusenberg, who you want to do a plug, you should do the Jake Dusenberg plug. Tell tell him who Jake Dusenberg is. <laughs> Jake Dusenberg is the executive director of the Minnesota <laughs> Tea Party Alliance. So if you go to www.teaparty.mn, nice. boom. Uh, Jake Dusenberg and Jack Rogers run the Tea Party Alliance, and he's a good friend, very pro liberty person. You wouldn't think everyone from the Tea Party is, but he, this guy actually is. He's libertarian oriented. Oh, he's and he's so. he's the right kind of guy to hang out with, talk to, whatever. He probably maybe I just given him too much pressure. Huge buddy. Austrian, but I was just gonna, yeah, I was just gonna say like email him, he'll get back to you. I don't know if he'll get back to you. I assume he seems like the type of guy that would get back to everybody, but just an awesome guy. And the reason I brought him up too is because okay, so Jake and I, <clears throat> I've known him for a few years now. Uh, big influence on me. Love hanging out with the dude. Now he's got the the wife, the kid, the the busy lifestyle. So I see him less. But there was like a Saturday where I was laying in bed in the morning eight or nine or something. I'm just like, what should I do? I was like, oh, I haven't seen Jake in a while. It's a weekend. At least send him a text. Maybe he's got some free time this weekend and I'm always down to podcast or go hang out, have a beer or anything. So I text him. He goes, hey, we're going up to, I'm going to, or want to go up to the Superior National Trail or whatever. He asked you or you asked Well, him? I just text him. Yeah, what are you up to? And he goes, going up there. And he goes, you want to go? And I'm like, geez, he goes, I'll pick you up at noon if you can make it. <laughs> I'm like, Shit. With like two hours to spit oh. to decide. And I have no hot weather hiking gear. It's going to be 90, 88 or something. And uh, it's all elk hunting gear, deer hunting gear. It's all winter gear. But I'm like, oh, so who's going? He goes, just me. I go, so if I wouldn't have texted you, you are about to drive like whatever, four plus hours in the woods and for like one night. It's a Saturday. And he's like, yup. He loves that stuff. Oh, man. And so he's like I, a nomad. He would be a perfect dude, vagabond. That guy. But he's a great hiking guy, too, because he doesn't. He's not too quiet, but he doesn't talk your ear off like I would. He's just got that perfect, we just talked the whole time, like just hop hard enough so that you can actually carry in a conversation, but you're panting, you know, like you're just on that limit. Like you're not like out of breath, but you're not like just strolling either. So it's just enough for your conversation. No one's annoying the piss out of each other. You can hike all day, two days, whatever. But man, we went up there and uh, I was so jacked because I bought a bunch of new like thin gear for warm weather for hiking. Can't wait to go back up Gooseberry River, Northeast Minnesota, all those places, just gorgeous. And all the wild roses were out there, these pink roses, just like thorn bushes. But you'd walk down the trail and you wouldn't even have to bend down sometimes to smell the roses. You could smell them. And it was just like freaking magical, you know? I love that, dude. <laughs> I love it. Like when you're walking and just smell like... They're not, flowers. they're not poisonous or anything. I no, know. they're pink. Ro- well, no, I think you can eat them. I think almost every rose, you can eat the petals. I mean, I grow some all back. They actually aren't, they're pretty, but they're not that fragrant. But just hiking up there, there's these like wild pink roses that grow. I looked them up on the internet. They grow like pretty much all in North America. But even yesterday, I rode motorcycle for like, an, man, like four hours or something. But I was way up by like St. Francis, Minnesota in these fields. And there's so much lilac wildflowers clover dandelion like everything you go down these roads you smell like gas and shit it's rolling cruising down these roads and then you get hit in the face for like a minute straight of a smell it smells like bath and body works i just always forget until this time of year because our season's so short people i mean it's cool to go get blasted on lake minnetonka like i've done that that's fun (laughs) but sometimes when you're yes that's great but sometimes when you're just rolling you're just flying on your bike and you just smell all that stuff. I don't know. It's magical. So I'm just I, go ahead. I'm just chuckling because I think that you segued from well, so anyway, we're talking about Joseph Story, Supreme Court Justice. And then you <laughs> launched into the <this laughs> soliloquy about your camping <laughs> experience. Because Jake Dusenberg, this is how I got what back to it, because because <laughs> freaking Jake Dusenberg and I were camping Which and then is this cool, next but... Yeah, then this last weekend, check out my YouTube channel, YouTube dot com slash t b m a g i s type in t mage t b m a g i s whatever or t e a m a g and i made the video because we my buddy and i went down to ledges state park in iowa and we camped out there 
Actually, we didn't even stay that night. We just left really late. Just went back to Des Moines and took a shower and drank a beer and went to bed. Beautiful, but we cooked on this ledge and I just, you drive around Iowa and the only reason I went down there is because Jake Duesenberg, shout out to Jake, he motivated the, the hell out of me to just start like going to crazy places to cook or camp or fish, but I just love to like cook, as you know. So Jake motivated me and you drive down there and then it was so funny because we're talking about your book and you have Joseph Story in your book in Ames, Iowa, like mm -hmm. West Ames is Ledge State Park where I was and everything there is Story County license plates because <laughs> in Iowa, they put your county on the license plate. So it says what county you're li you live oh, okay. in. So like you can be like, the northeast part of Iowa can hate the southwest part and they can like hate <laughs> that's each the other. Reason. Dude, yeah, that's the reason the they do it. But no, I violence. love that they identify you. Like I just love that. Like you have to not only do you have to have your plate, like we have Minnesota plates, and that's as far as it goes. Like we're from Minnesota. You can be from Grand Marais or Morris. It doesn't matter. It's because you know? we're Minnesota nice, you know. Yeah. But down there they like call you out. <laughs> but everyone's Story County, like everyone's from Story County, I swear. <laughs> just go on the highway. Apparently Ames is bigger than Iowa City in Des Moines, but <laughs> But Story County, that's named after Joseph Story. That's right. Isn't it? Yeah. Joseph Story is like your favorite guy of all time. Uh, I'd say <laughs> that's uh, hyperbole. <laughs> I'm not a fan. In fact, the premise of my book is to deconstruct Thor uh, st I'm sorry, Story's conception of the United States Union because... I mean, this might not be interesting yeah. to every everyone. Uh, it's but interesting to me. That's all this podcast. Three people listen to this podcast. <laughs> me, you, and me. So And our parents. And our parents. They're so proud yeah. of us right now. But, uh, <laughs> and the NSA. That's five people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Story's theory was that the United States Union, and he published sure. this viewpoint for the first time in 1833. So just think about that. That's about you know 40 years after the you know George Washington's inauguration. Yeah. Right? So for 40 years... The Constitution was only viewed as a compact among states. There wasn't really a nationalist narrative. And what yeah, I mean like by nothing that... nothing almost. Right. And that's how it was always understood to be. But when Story publishes this Commentaries of the Constitution in 1833, he deduced that for some reason, and I can't follow his train of logic at all, but he said that the United States Constitution was ratified by one people, and it was never intended to be ratified Where was otherwise. he from? Do you remember? Yeah, Massachusetts. Uh, How'd he end up in Iowa? Well, just they're honoring him, right? So, but, <laughs> but, well, in Massachusetts... You mean he I mean, didn't hike the Ledger State Park like I did? <laughs> I don't think he did, but there's a dormitory in Harvard that bears his name, too. I mean, he's a relatively famous figure. Why, why, why did he get famous? Well, he was famous because he was appointed to the Supreme Court by James Madison. And he actually... Because I knew he was in the Supreme Court and then past that, I was kind of like, oh, I forget it. You probably told me in your book and, and he, I already forgot. Here's the most frustrating thing, too, is that he was perceived as a Jeffersonian who actually believed in, you know, decentralized authority like sure. Jefferson did. So Madison appoints him during his presidency. Well, he becomes the exact opposite. He becomes a devout follower of John Marshall and really conceptualizes the American Union as a nationalist nation state. Did where something change that, though, for him Do that you know of, or is it just something you just, just see in his actions, you just know that's what yeah, he did? Yeah, I don't know what the impetus for it was. Yeah. I don't know if he just respected John Marshall so much, or you know, it was one of these things where John Marshall said, hey, kid, you know, follow me, and I'll show you what's <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I mean, damn, could I don't be, be, right? Could who be. knows? But I deconstruct a story's narrative in my book. I mean... It's so telling. He said that the union was ratified by one people instead of the states. Well, that would run completely counter to Article 7 of the Constitution, which says that the Constitution's instrument for ratification is individual uh, ratification conventions in each of the states, whereupon nine states would be required for the Constitution to achieve legal bearing. So it really was done state by state, and some states actually initially rejected it. So story's wrong, and that's why I don't like story, but in my <laughs> intro chapter, I talk about all these things. His, uh, and the whole thing with him, too, is his father was supposedly in the Boston Tea Party, but they didn't talk about it, but his father did, so that there's speculation that his father wasn't. He was just kind of some bigwig guy that was flying high. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. It is correct that his father was a part of the Sons of Liberty in Boston, which in December of 1773 
participated in what's now known as the Boston Tea Party. It, it was then sometimes called the incident with the tea, right? Yeah. But as part of this, you know, the people first swore an oath that, that were involved, swore an oath saying that they would not divulge the fact that they had participated in this Boston Tea Party that was going to take place. And second, they dressed as Mohawk Indians to kind of, you know, uh, shield their presence from being known. But also some people say that that was to make it like a, a distinctly American rebellion so they would be differentiated from the British. But yeah, you're right. We don't know if Elijah's story did participate. He said he did, but that's a, that's the thing that's interesting. We just don't know really because of, you know, how disguised people I feel were. like there would be a it's tenfold the number of people that said that they were part of it. You know, sort of like <laughs> I, when I go to like a Rolling Stones concert and I'm like in the upper level of the Excel Center and then like I'm drunk like a week later and I'm like, yeah, and I, I was like, Mick yeah, Jagger. I was going to say, no, I was say I, I threw like a, I threw like a we granola bar beers. on stage and he started eating it while he was singing or something. <laughs> 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 Oh, it actually God. happened. I did. <laughs> yeah, that's so, called no, a but stretch. Honestly, that's, yeah, that's a stretch. That's, that's my example of a stretch. You know, but honestly, knows? I brought that up just to yeah. give the example uh, about how I view a lot of these dum dums in history, where they're like, "Oh, my dad was at the." I mean, that's what he, dude. He's he's Joseph's story. Yo, my dad was in the secret society, but I know because they can't tell anybody. But I know, and it's like, well, where's the link? You know, where's the you know, break in the continuity of what's going on here. So is it a tall tale type situation? That's the interesting thing about history, right? Everything's yeah, in any interpretive. Si yeah, in any, in any part of history, like how many tall tales exist, the answer is probably almost all of them in a some way, shape, or form. There's a lot of things that can't be fully substantiated. The job of historians is to try to you know, garner enough of an impression to actually make yeah. something of an accurate judgment or perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And and say like your new book going over a lot of this stuff. I mean, how do you approach it then? Trying to figure out what's accurate. Is it always just like in high school history, like you got to go primary sources? That, and this then is you such read, a good point to bring and up. And then, yeah. you, okay, good. One second here and then I'll, I'll, sure. I'll wind you up and let you go. I mean, you got a primary source for those listening. I mean, even journalism, anything like that, all the BS I do on the side, and I'm just an amateur at all of it. But I mean, you're not going to be significant to anyone by parroting an idea. You can parrot an idea, which is nowadays half of journalism, and then the next 25 percentile up are people that analyze the, the other people's analysis of a primary source, and that's better than parroting ideas. But still, you haven't ana analyzed um, the primary source yourself, and I feel like then you have to now you have to go into the analysis of the people who analyze the primary source. You analyze the primary source. You come up with two separate conclusions, which is one your opinion of the primary source, and the other is a balance of everyone else's analysis. And then you have to play it off together. And then when people get really into it, they start to meet the other people who analyze primary sources, and they start to basically say. I think it means this, I think it means this. And it's the same way when I've been obsessed with ancient Egypt forever and you watch nine out of 10 documentaries and the person is standing in front of hieroglyphs saying, right here it says this, right here it says this, and this means this. And then the next guy says it and it's the same hieroglyph, it means the same thing. And then you get to like the ninth or 10th one and he goes, first of all, if someone tells you they know exactly what this means, they're full of shit. And then he basically <laughs> says like, we think it means this. The erosion says it means something different. The erosion on the Sphinx means it's 20,000 years old, not eight or, you know, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's how, like, to me, I think it's just Egypt's my favorite to go back to because the whole primary source thing, it's like you, the hieroglyphics thing's hilarious because it's the same analogy as uh, of uh, constitutional writings of Federalist Papers, whatever. Sure. You want to know what the Federalist Papers are about, you got to read them and then you got to meet people who've also read them and bounce your ideas off each other. Whereas if you're someone like me, I love to watch documentaries. I look at three historians reading hieroglyphics and they all say the same thing. I go, damn, it's like a 90% chance, 99% chance that they're, they're on to something until you meet that one person that says, no, no one knows what they're talking about and this is why. And they bring you back to the primary source, the primary evidence. And then all of a sudden you're like, your dreams are shattered because you were too much in the realm of like listening to what another human being was saying rather than judging it yourself. So how does that work for your book? Come along long winded question, but yeah. how does that work? I mean, you got to read primary sources and then you got to basically read a lot of people who have already, you know, 
gone through the complete inspection and analysis, and then you got to analyze them yourself and bounce those ideas continuously, simultaneously off each other, right? Yeah, I think that you brought up at least two very good points. Um, yes, I do believe that primary sources have to be more considered more definitive than secondhand accounts just because of their very nature, but that it doesn't always tell the t full tale because words and actions can often be different. You, you can see politicians doing totally. this in every age, totally. right? Yeah. They will write something and then their actions will do something different. Well, when I, as a historian, try to, you know, analyze this stuff, I, I really try to go off what actually happened, the factual things. Words, if, if they meet with the facts, can be very powerful, but you have to corroborate it that way. Now, when I'm writing, my first book really has very, very few secondhand sources referenced. But the ones that Sweet. I do are people that I trust that I believe corroborate with the p primary sources. So it's not something where it just seemed to have come out of somewhere else, you know, 200 years ago. I made it a point actually to put in my book that, you know, when I'm explaining what I mean about the constitution, I'm going to revisit the state ratification conventions, not what federal judges said 200 years later, 150 years later and things like that. So that's well, getting, how kind of I view it. That's a sweet answer. I mean, you, you hit exactly what I thought you would say in a, in a, Great way, not a diss. <laughs> I mean, that's hell yeah, that's exactly... Better not be a diss. Damn it. <laughs> but no, and talking about like <laughs> Supreme Court justices and citing things 100 to 200 years later, let's say, and you're going, dude, like, come on, what did you not even analyze the primary source here? So-and-so uh, meant this, and you cited them, and I think you skewed it either knowingly or unknowingly, but you basically cited something, Mr. Or Mrs. Supreme Court Justice, who is, is doing a disservice to the people who you're citing, and now you're going to convince... Little Jimmy, who's nine years old, and he tuned into C-SPAN four, and he, he <laughs> saw you do this, and all of a sudden you just you skewed history, you bastard! Like, you know what I mean? Did yeah, you I mean, that? the the founders never conceived of like a federal judiciary that would <laughs> reference that they would come to their conclusions on constitutional topics based on you know a federal court case from seven years ago. Right, but if yeah, you, yeah, if you look at these opinions now, and feel free to read the most controversial ones from this week, the justices, and this goes across, you know, ideological boundaries, but they will reference, you know, cases from ten years ago to explain their constitutional position on this, where and they should be referring back to the state ratification conventions and how those advocates sold the constitution. That's where we can take what the constitution meant. Man, that's you always wonder. If there's just like a time limit where no matter what we do, and it could mean we as the whole collective or we as in starting with you, Mr. Dave and me, you know, you just wonder if there's a, if the, if there's a hourglass full of sand and it's just going to go out and there's nothing you can do because that's what happens to dynamic groups of people that are in a, a boxed in area defined as a state, a nation state, an autonomous region a grouping, a country, whatever you want to call it, province, anything, you just wonder if there's a tipping point and then you got to keep your own sanity because you're like, I want to fight for like the best ideals. I want to keep getting smarter every day. I want to keep analyzing history every day. But eventually, maybe there's going to be a point where you're like, okay, whatever I, systems I was buying into, I better be soft on them and keep a, a, a like a human ideology or collective ideology rather than some, you know, Colors, flags, language, culture, religion, God forbid, lack of religion, God forbid, anything where you just got to be like, dude, I just feel like something, something bad's about to happen. And I just want to judge my, like, where can I spread myself? Say, uh, <clears throat> Borneo, say there's the, it's the freest area of land mass and I can go there and I can promote my ideals. It's almost like the fight or flight now that I'm talking about, but you know what I mean? Like, isn't it a weird thing in history when you idolize ideologies or even the debate of ideologies you may or not agree with in certain crucial volatile periods of history such as late 1700s and that's what we all because we're just talking about for example citing you know supreme court justices citing those those areas because that's what the original intent of the documents we still apparently are trying to you know s subscribe to and so it's just i just wonder if it's one of those things where eventually there's just going to be that tipping point nothing you can do all we're doing is buying a day pre that date or a day after that date and eventually you're just all you can do is try to find like the freest area to promote your ideology go there 
You know what I mean? Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe, uh, maybe infiltrating or fighting against or whatever. Slaying dragons is what I'm trying to say. Maybe that's all, you know, it's for the birds. Maybe that's just garbage. And maybe the only way to live life is to, like, be a voluntarist in the sense of, you know what? Fleeing isn't a cowardly act if all you're doing is trying to find a place to propagate positive, positive things, positive ideas, positive actions. Maybe that's not fleeing. Maybe that's just, like, free market human beings trying to go somewhere to produce goodness and leave, you know, evil. Because I don't know. If I, if I saw someone getting their purse snatched, I'd love to think I'd jump off my table, put down my Indeed Midnight Rider black ale, and take off after some mofo. <laughs> Do you mofo. work for Indeed? <laughs> I want to. But you know, I, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like you and I, if we look at each other in the eye and we're just like, dude, I should, uh, I should go chase down this woman I just saw like one microsecond ago steal this purse. I'm going to do it. But bring it to a big scale where you just start identifying with the internet to people in all countries around the world with positive ideas. You're like, that's what I believe. That's what I believe. Oh, natural rights. Oh, you know, social contract theory doesn't mean that 51% could tell me what to do. Like all these different universal ideas. Are we getting to this global consciousness of knowledge now where the whole idea of the state, which a lot of people would think is, is garbage and old school anyways, and maybe myself included, probably myself included, but... Even if the state's legit, if you got to subscribe to another state to produce goodness elsewhere, I mean, isn't that to the point we're hitting now? I mean, you can save up two weeks of your work pay and probably go to any country in the world if you have an average salary job in America, even with a high school degree. Like two weeks pay can probably buy you a ticket to go probably most anywhere in places, the world. Right? Yeah. yeah. If you're working like 40, 50 hours a week in America... And you you know you're not making ten dollars an hour you're making twenty or plus or something but you can save up at least two weeks so you can probably go anywhere you want. I think you're making about the best arguments in favor of federalism <laughs> right now because we used to respect the ability to quote you know vote with our feet like mm -hmm. if our neighboring state of Wisconsin actually had you know differing laws regarding you know property yeah if we like those laws more if they were great enough to impel us to move there we could but. You know, the federal government and world, you know, world governments like the UN and, you know, globalist regimes have tried to assume so much of this, more of this role that was used to be attributed to states and communities where now they try to impose judgments upon everyone. I think that decentralization is the way to go. And you see people in the U.S. denunciating their citizenship sometimes, you know. They take their money to other countries and things like that. I mean, yeah, that's some people's tipping point. I don't know what the ultimate tipping point would be, though. It's it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that because I'm just shocked that more people aren't at a tipping point right now. But Yeah, that dude, that's a good statement. But I, myself included, you get to a point, the ignorance is bliss thing kicks in, and even if it's for a week, even if I spend three weeks out of a month, going to work, but then spending a lot of time reading or talking to people or doing podcasts or videos or something. But then you kind of hit a point and you're just like, dude, I'm just going to garden and grill pork chops. Sure. <laughs> you the know what I mean? security of complacency. It's it is. A, it's a, so it's a litmus it's test a for my human, own psyche. It, it's a human, um, I don't know if it's a weakness, but it's a definite human factor. I mean, I I love my friends that I have here. I don't want to abandon, yeah. you know, my geography simply because right. I hate the government. Yeah, so it's, there's other factors. That's hard. Yeah, I don't know. I think those memes on the internet, on Facebook, especially and stuff, where they're like, "Don't like prostitutes? Become a pimp and change it from the inside." <laughs> Like, everything's like, don't like the government, become a Supreme Court justice and change from the inside. Like, you know, but they just get more ridiculous. You know what I'm talking about, that yeah. meme? Yeah, and they just become more ridiculous. And to me, it's becoming my favorite meme <laughs> because it's like, it's just so ridiculous. Like, don't like pedophilia in the church, become a priest and change it from the inside. Like, it's all hyperbole, of course. Yeah. But I think it's a great, anytime hyperbole like that doesn't get old after 12 of them. <laughs> You go, okay, there's a, there's a point in there that makes me laugh every time because it's that true. Sure. Which is the whole like notion that's just like pushed down, top down upon you through media and through the individual culture of your friends and your family, which is, yeah, you can make a difference and you can do anything you want, 
But then at the same time, if there's like a big problem, instead of actually acting the way that you want to act in life, that you should just like join whatever union, whatever job, applicant pool, whatever, whatever, and go all the way up in the ranks and try to change it from the inside. Which is hilarious when the memes are like, don't like the mafia, become a Don Corleone and change it from the inside. You know, like it's, I feel like there's this, that's the hyperbole that'll never go away. Only our little pop culture funny examples will go away. But that will always be there. Become sure. Ro- Cicero and change it from the inside, you know, like <laughs> in Rome. Like, but that, I don't yeah. know, to me, that's the never ending, that's an infinite hyperbole that will always be a socially conscious joke slash serious comment. You just change the example depending on what's relevant to our brains at the time, you know? So I don't know. I mean, in your book, before we get out of here, I guess we can, I just, I love asking you about your book, which is kind of like great because we can plug I it. I love you continually bringing it up in front of this audience. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, in your book, I mean, yeah. obviously you've been talking about my hilarious, like memes on the internet, not my hilarious, my memes suck, but <laughs> you know, like the stuff that's hyperbole that people that like history like political or social commentary. So they appreciate memes or they appreciate jokes, societal jokes with hyperbole, because what that does is it illuminates some kind of uh, call and response, some kind of st- stimulus and you know reaction situation. And those change, you know what I mean? And, and they change based on what your pop culture area, what your social areas around you, your identity and all that stuff. But I think like what is cool about hanging out with you is whenever I'm ranting, like I say, you know exactly what I'm talking about. A lot of people would be lost, lose me every five seconds. But with your book or books or even the research that you've done, I mean, a lot of these things that when I talk to you, just guy to guy, just bullshit and having some beers and stuff, these things are so transcendent. And yeah, we can compare a historical event in the past to the present, which we've kind of been doing all day and I could do yeah. every day and it's great. But at the same time, what, like talking about jokes and memes and stuff, I mean, the hyperbole is alluding to attitudes that are transcendent. And it's not like the actions, it's almost like the person inside, or the group, it's almost a collection, it's a societal thing. Like the meme itself is these, at, like these attitudes and these belief systems and these, it's like a style. It's like a style of communication, a style of thinking, a style of wholehearted societal you know, cohesion of people. And so I don't know, like in your, in your new book, what would you say are some of these themes? Here's a great broad question, which you'll have no problem answer to reel it all back in. I mean, what are some of these themes like that, that to you are still exciting? Maybe they're new, maybe they were in your old book, but obviously almost everything you can think of is somehow transcendent. So what are these ones that are just absolutely in our face transcendent, whether we've touched on them tonight or not? What do you think are some of those ones that you've been just indulging in and writing about? Yeah. And all well, that. so I'll, I'll just, a few of the key ones is that no matter how uh, people have attempted to constrain government, it yeah. always gradually becomes Oof. transitions to more power in the center. That's what yeah. I really believe in. And I don't think that, you know, many of the founders would have disagreed with that either. It's just, how do you constrain it? The other thing is that, like I think we've already mentioned, I don't think human nature has changed. No matter you right. know, the social dynamics, the improvements in technology, the new social mores, anything like that, human nature still largely remains the same. And people, especially those in power, are inclined to prestige and control and you know, willing to deprive people of wealth, property, and liberty. So I guess those two themes, but also that... You know, there is, there still is hope despite all the problems. I think one of the pro- the things that some libertarians fall into, a trap, and I have done this as well, is, you know, you, you just become this ultimate complainer, and that's all you do is just complain about the world around you. But I really do believe there is methods to interpose and perpetuate human liberty. It might not always be apparent, but there are ways. So I guess those three themes. And... Do you draw any, uh, not conclusions, but any, I guess, like, close lines between ideas that you're writing about in this new book and the ways to interpose those in, in society, as you were saying? Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what yeah. would you say, I guess, about that? I mean, you don't have to go too deep, or if something comes to mind, just rant on it, you know, but it's, yeah. it's uh, 
I, I like how you kind of sum those up. They're very concise answers. So, I mean, as far as are there ways that you're writing about in this new book that the average person is going to maybe in their daily life feel differently about, you know, like on the small level, but the level that's been the same for hundreds of years, like how are people going to basically take these ideas and within a day or two, you know, view the world differently, act upon the world differently. <laughs> well, I hope know? my book does that to one person and then I'll be happy. I was just laughing in my head there like when I was rambling going, I wonder if this is like pressure on you now. Like, no, I, I do. How think- are you going to change the lives of people is what I almost <laughs> asked you there. <laughs> How are well, the daily lives of everyone going to be different after reading your book? Go. Well, I, I'm a historian. Only $100 on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a historian that does not claim to have the ultimate uh, solution to the problems. I highlight well, some of the problems. Yeah. But I do think there are a few positive things, and I did highlight them in the last chapter of nice. Compact to the Republic. And the two things I'll just speak on real quickly yeah. is that I think that almost everything in humanity can be solved by better education. And I don't mean statist education. I mean education that makes you able to interpret ideas that you wouldn't have come across in public school and things like that. So I think education is the key to everything. Um, We talked a little bit about the Internet makes delivery of ideas so much easier. And the Internet is really just an, an incredibly important mechanism for that but also i mean to support local resistance efforts to i mean yeah. all the way to the individual level i argue in the book that you know it took ire and resistance and resilience for rosa parks to decide i'm not going to follow this unjust law i'm going right. to sit here defiantly yep. because this is unjust and potentially i mean you can apply that to unjust unconstitutional things but even to the state level i mean the the units that compose a government have to stand against like a bulwark, like a shield against the federal authority and larger authorities when they make tyrannical and terrible laws. So resistance and education. So really what you told me right there is just like team HTV, you got to be engaged in civil disobedience, even on the most minute level. Even if you go out, you find the girl that didn't go to prom with you, you guys make a baby, and you guys do lemonade stands every day. As long and as the all NS- get arrested, <laughs> as long as the NSA isn't listening, <laughs> yes, that's what I said. You're good. <laughs> you guys and your your baby out of wedlock, but you're happy as hell, and you share the family home, and it's you have a big sign out front. It says lemonade, ring buzzer, ten cents, <laughs> and every day you sell untaxed free market lemonade every day. That's the goal of my whole life. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say getting a house with an unmarried woman, but it's getting close. I'm <laughs> thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Got the add on on Craigslist. <laughs> I said, has to be willing to go to jail for lemonade stands. I will have a child with you <laughs> unwed for, le- for the lemonade stands and for freedom. I don't know how to respond. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't. It's, okay. I just, I'm just digging a hole like I tend to do. <laughs> But no, that's cool. I, I just, to get back to civil disobedience, no, for sure. That's, that's awesome. I really like the way you phrased it too. It's a lot different than the way I phrased it. But you know, I mean, that's, I think that's the only way, right? Cause, because isn't that, anytime you harp on civil disobedience, aren't you, what you're really saying is there is a system in place that we're being taught that it's the way you ought to go and to, to get something done. But at the end of the day, the people teaching you these things are the people that want you to depend on the system when in reality human conduct is dictated by a peaceful interaction on what you choose to do. I choose to lead my life this way, and as long as I'm living it without interfering in anyone else, then I should be able to do so. Does that sound kind of right? Yeah. I mean, is, that, is that the same thing as why civil disobedience is important? Because if, if you're doing civil disobedience against someone restricting peaceful action and you can say wow this is a righteous thing that i'm choosing to do and being restricted i'm going to do it anyway and i'm going to suffer the consequences that's civil disobedience but i'm exercising rights that i'm granted by being alive yeah i think it's important for principle and exposure i mean for principle just to have a demonstrable situation that categorize or characterizes what you stand for but exposure because you know, the most famous cases, and I brought up Rosa Parks, but there's so many mm-hmm. more, 
of that that type of defiance that really d- actually does have the power to change a society like we often hear from the civil rights uh, era i mean this is the narrative that i got in public schools that you know brown versus the board of education you know fixed everything you know the, this this federal lawsuit was settled and the federal government passed you know the civil rights act but no i think that it it changed at the individual level it was a story of people that remained defiant because their state governments in this case made laws that prevented them from engaging in transactions with people that sometimes the business owners wanted to transact with and definitely the individuals wanted yeah, to Yeah, the one side of civil rights that you don't get. You'd never where get a business that side. where a business owner wanted to yeah. interact freely in his or her community and there was someone in Washington DC with a law that basically stated how to conduct with a business sure. with another And even person. on the state level, local level. Or I sure, mean, there you go. Even all on sorts state of local, states yeah. have made, you know, laws to prevent that. But that's the real story to me of, you know, individual resistance is that, you know, that has the power to actually transform societies to the benefit of liberty. I agree. That's very cool. The way you, uh, I don't know, the way you put that. Before we get out of here, I don't know. I feel like we talked about everything I and plus a lot more that I want to talk about, but the whole mercantilism idea is being a, a climate of conduct in the late 1700s that was shaping the way that people saw the world, especially the way they saw organizational communication. And that's a term, I guess, because that's what I studied in college, but it's like the way they saw organiz- organizational communication, meaning, yeah, business, yeah, the state, yeah, groups of people in whatever private or public uh, groups that they were in. But the idea of mercantilism, um, before we get out of here, I mean, is there, a, is there a way or a couple good ways or any way that you can think of uh, translating that to today? Like the average perspectives of people under what we call right now mercantilism which they did at the time, right? Am I wrong? They called it yeah. that at the time. It was yeah. a term that it was a it was a mainstream term that they used then and now. Yeah, there or was did a multiple shift? term. There was some. Okay, because that's where I don't know, and that's in part of the question, I guess, too. But it's like you can talk about what it meant then or today or whatever you want. But I was just wondering how you could translate that, I guess, to like today, because you and I could talk for five hours about that. But I sure. just think it's a great way to kind of end this. What do you have to say, I guess? I think it translates in almost every way directly today. I mean, just real quick examples. I mean, the net neutrality debate sparked up, you know, days, you know, a few months ago, I'd say at its height. And really, I mean, you can't deny that the federal government has used classical mercantilist uh, theory to, you know, award these trade privileges to certain firms that, you know, control telecommunications like, you know, Comcast or you know, Time Warner, all the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. So that is taking place right now. And you see, you know, the bailouts of 2007, or was it 2008, like the big bailouts? Do you remember? I think that was... Uh, I I was going to say seven or eight, but... Yeah, but But, I mean, you see these these subsidies and bailouts that are all characteristic of a mercantilist system where the government really just, you know, feeds uh, these these people that lobby so hard just to keep, you know, their firms and businesses afloat where we could just reject that outright and let the invisible hand of the free market dictate this stuff. So yeah. I see it applies directly to today. Mercantilism. So, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about like corporatism being the same thing, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess in a way, Cause that's co- I, isn't corporatism where private enterprise in the state through whatever edicts, whatever force of the state's hand, not the invisible hand of the market, but the state's hand, that's what creates corporatism versus some kind of free market ugly system, right? Sure. I guess I wouldn't, the semantics involved, I wouldn't be able to delineate as well. I always think of corporatism is the, the, basically the way it's set up, like the whole corporations are people, my friend Mitt Romney quote, you know, like the corporation set up so that the profits are, can be private as much as possible, but the losses can be public. That's the way I see it versus like free market enterprise. Where you're like, oh, the corporations are running everything. I'm like, yeah. And then you're like, oh, these rich companies or something. And it's like, well, now you're just splitting hairs. Because no, like a company and a corporation would be different things per se. Like the corporation is under the the company. Like the corporation is going to be a specific type of company that's tied into the government essentially. And it's judged as an individual, which can only be by some edict of the state. If that makes any sense. Like that's the way I view it, I guess. 
So I don't know if like mercantilism was because I view it as corporatism because he had like British East India Company basically <laughs> dictating state policy or let's say intertwined with state policy. Is that correct? Oh yeah, I mean that's okay. the, the forgotten factor of the Boston Tea Party. It there was trade privileges. So that's where I see. And company. would you call that mercantilism? Yeah. Okay, so there Absolutely. you go. So not to interrupt, I'll, I'll love to keep you to or I'd love to keep no, you going on this, fine. but but no, that's what I was asking you. I guess like right there when I kind of interrupted was like that whole Boston Tea Party, that whole British British East India Company history. Like even go to the Wikipedia page of the British East India Company for you listeners. I mean, you should familiarize yourself. Look up their flag. It's essentially like the pre-US flag, like with the stripes and the stars. And I mean, look up the British East India Company's corporate flag and then look up the first flag of the US. It's almost the same flag. I mean, it is as much intertwined with the formation of what we call these United States, which is now the United States, but you know, was these, you know, compact as his book here, Mr. Benner, Compact of the Republic, but the whole mercantilism system, if you ask me as, as the listeners may be able to understand so far with my rambling is, dude, Mercantilism and modern day corporatism, to me, I'm drawing like the utmost parallels between the two. And that's why I keep kind of asking these yeah. questions, Dave, is like, I don't even know if there's a difference. I wouldn't know a difference. Yeah, like, I, I wouldn't either. Oh, there the you go. terminology, well, that, I don't know the difference. That's what I mean. That's what's so amazing. And like, I would have thought you would have had like 10 differences. So at least I'm hitting the nail on the head right now because <laughs> it's like, right, it's the same scenario. The mercantilism and the modern day corporatism to me, they just ring the same bell, they feel the same, they smell the same. And so that's kind of why I think American Revolution and, and hanging out with you and having you on my podcast here, it's just so damn interesting because there's so much to learn there and the more you learn, the more creepy it is with the parallels between now and then. And the whole mercantilist system was, how, how heavily engaged would you say as far as like the grievances against the British Empire? Oh, it, it was a key factor they, in the denunciation of Parliament and the It was King. interwoven to the utmost degree, right? Absolutely. It the constitutional arguments that were being made uh, were very much highlighting the Dude. deprivation of uh, the ability to conduct free trade. And it's... Do you know anything about how the British East India Company was bankrupted or no? Oh, I, I don't know really. I, much, I honestly but, don't know, okay. but I do know that yeah, obviously they were bankrupt. Or maybe not right. bankrupted, but even like the start or finish of the demise is what I'm even asking in the most broadest sense. Because I don't really know, but I just know like the British Empire and that were once again interwoven to the point where they kind of went down together. But you know, yeah, the American I, Revolution had a huge part in that, I believe. Yeah, at least in the United States. But then again, there were some American revolutionaries that supported the British system too. So. Yeah. that's uh <laughs> jefferson was a free trader hamilton yeah. believed in mercantilism yeah. he thought that's what made the british empire great so how much of those two work together in your opinion you know what i mean not work together physically in the same room maybe so but how much did any of their doctrines or ideologies have a synergistic effect rather than actually butt heads between jefferson and hamilton yeah Oh, it's hard to say. I'd say the one thing is that at least when they both served in Washington's cabinet, both had a lot of respect for George Washington. I think Hamilton oh. more so. Uh, Jefferson eventually resigned because he felt that Washington was all, always, um, always more, much more influenced by the Hamiltonian narrative than Jefferson really? on everything. I mean, from <clears throat> from everything, the National Bank to the Jay Treaty to. Uh, the the neutrality doctrine where the president decided that you know the U.S. would maintain neutrality in the French and British war that was taking place at the time. So uh, I think ultimately respect for Washington as kind of like the the glue that could actually hold this republic together at the beginning stages. But I they really didn't work together very much. The the only method of cooperation that happened between the two that I w I think is noteworthy is. Jefferson made an agreement with Jefferson's faction at that point in the early 1790s. He, him and Madison organized the Republican Party, not the modern Republican Party, but the first one. Hamilton was so disgruntled that the states, uh, he wanted the, the federal government to assume the state debts from the revolution. So he and Jefferson came to an agreement that the federal government could assume the state debts if the capital was moved to a southern state. 
And this agreement is something that Jefferson thought was the worst mistake of his life. He wrote about this later, but we know that, you know, Washington DC is now the capital largely because of that. Yeah. I mean, really. So the only agreement that the two substantially had ended up in something that Thomas Jefferson considered a total error. So. Jeez. And who was aligned with Jefferson the most? Well, in Washington's cabinet, Edmund Randolph, his, the fellow Virginian who had served as its governor, was more beholden to Jefferson than, than certainly Hamilton. But Jefferson felt at a loss to be able to influence uh, the president because there was a Federalist Congress that actually agreed with most of what Hamilton was proposing at the time. All right. Well, Compact of the Republic, awesome book. Do you have a name for the next book? Uh, tentatively, kind of. I, the tentative title is "Destiny of the Empire State." <laughs> Sounds like Star Wars. New York's ratification. Okay, struggle. no, it doesn't. So no, it doesn't. We'll see if that ends up being <laughs> the title, but that's it for now. That's sweet. Yeah, I got Mr. Dave Benner here. Compact of the Republic is his last book. You can is the best Amazon to go to Amazon. Yeah, best. That's where I bought my copy. I sell copies during my okay. speaking engagements that I can personalize, but Amazon's the best route otherwise. Very cool. So everyone should check out Compact of the Republic by Dave Benner. His next book, uh, I love Tom Woods, is coming out soon. <laughs> it's and a Tom Woods biography. It's a Tom. <laughs> <laughs> written in crayon. On, on I am, on we're napkins. both big fans of Woods, is the inside uh, joke, look, I guess. Yeah, Tom Woods is our hero, so Tom Woods is a good guy. Otherwise, yeah, June 28th, Sunday, we had a, what, Delirium Tremens. We had some Estrella, which is a uh, light beer from Barcelona, Spain. We had a Midnight Rider, which is the black IPA from Indeed in northeast Minneapolis. and They're talk- good beers, and we still didn't end up as statists by the end of the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? So After, I think the first podcast every day was with Duesenberg, or at least on these <laughs> subjects, and he was talking about the, like, the two- or three-tier system of beer distribution in Minnesota, and he was just so like passionate about it, and I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> you got to sell the distributor? You can't even sell what? You can't sell where you brew it? Until they changed it. So that's why Indeed, Fulton, all these different places around town, Dangerous Man 612. If you drink beer, come to Minneapolis. I think we got the best beer culture in the Midwest. I think it's a lot better in Chicago and Milwaukee. Heaven forbid. I just, I really do. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have said that, but now I will. So Minneapolis, craft brewing, brewing, beer, brewing. I can't say it. Otherwise... Get your beer on. Read Compact to the Republic by Dave Benner. Check in. Team Age Podcast. Maybe I'll do another one soon. And, uh, yeah, the ideas of natural rights transcending almost a 1,000 plus years, guys. So check it out. And uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It was yeah, a I appreciate blast, it. So. you going to do another one soon. or We better. Yeah. I'm counting we, on it. Well, you, you got a Dave Benner uh, something coming up, or what's up with Dave Benner uh, podcast? Podcast is back. I'm not sure how regular it will be, but we'll, we'll do something special soon. Very cool. All right. Team Age Podcast. Everybody have a good weekend. Peace out.